Okay. So we'll start the program. I'll call Madam to just uh, the president of Trivandrum Obijan Club uh, to say the welcome address before we start the event. Very nice seeing all of you. And uh, I am waiting to hear what you are all going to say about the particular topic because it's a very interesting topic. And uh, everybody, I am sure, will be able to hear it so that they will gain valuable information. So I think uh, if everybody is in position and uh, everybody is ready, I think we can start the session. Thank you, Madam, for your Thank you, Madam, words. for your Thank you. words. And it is nice to see you after a gap of and six it is months. nice to see you after a gap of six months. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think I'll just mute yeah. your uh, audio I think I'll because, just mute your, your because, yeah. because echo, echo is on. Okay. I think uh, we are starting the meeting now. And uh, I would like to welcome uh, all of all the participants as well as the other two speakers. Uh, Dr. P.G. Paul from Paul's Hospital, Cochin. Uh, good evening, Dr. Paul. And uh, Dr. Hafiz from uh, Sunrise Group of Hospitals from Cochin. And uh, the event, uh, um, as you know, that uh, event has been put as a Three Musketers uh, event because uh, Three Musketers is a historical uh, uh, what do you call, adventure, a novel written written by Alexandre Dumas. And uh, it is a swashbuckling, chivalrous swordman who fight for justice. But here, uh, we find that the Three Musketers are uh, two people on the screen. Of course, the three people on the screen. And... Uh, uh, we are just no, not going to uh, be chivalrous or swordsmen. Uh, we are going to express uh, our ideas and thoughts about uh, three topics in endoscopy. And uh, I will. I don't have any CV of Dr. Paul or Hafiz because I know them for the past two to three decades. I would like to introduce Dr. P.G. Paul. P.G. Paul, uh, I know for the past uh, more than 35 years. And Hafiz for the last uh, two decades, more than 20 years. And uh, actually, P.G. Paul, uh, uh, we know each other from the beginning itself, the 80s and early 90s, when Dr. Rajan used to conduct the monthly meeting at uh, uh, Kuchin. And uh, we used to meet once in three to four months, and there were so many nice meetings which uh, acted as a mentor. And uh, to go back to P.G. Paul, he started his practice in General Hospital at, uh, at uh, Anolam and then uh, attending various workshops, conferences. Uh, we have gained more knowledge and developed the skin and caliber. Especially Paul doesn't have any, it's, it's, he's a master of himself. He has gained all the knowledge and developed the skill and caliber with his own efforts and started sharing his skill and knowledge to various people, fellows, and also by doing workshops. It's always a treat to watch uh, uh, the artistic skill of P.G. Paul. And I'd like to welcome Dr. P.G. Paul. And I'd like, just like to say my personal involvement, <clears throat> that was in early 1990, when I was working in a city hospital, Paul had started about five years back his uh, endoscopy in 85. I presume that he started uh, doing operative laparoscopy. And in a city hospital, uh, you know, it's a government setup. We had the basic cam, uh, we had the basic telescope, light source, but there was no for hand instruments. I still remember that uh, Dr. P.G. Paul gave <clears throat> his whole set of instruments which he was using. And uh, I could use it uh, at, uh, for the patients who are coming to SAT hospital in 1990s, must be around about 1990 or 95. And these equipments were the hand instruments especially which he was using. And uh, we could use it for the poor patients who were coming in SAT hospital. And uh, it is always a treat to watch uh, P.G. Paul talking or working or doing a workshop. So welcome Dr. P.G. Paul. And uh, the next speaker will be Dr. Hafiz. And uh, I think uh, Hafiz, uh, I think it's better to say about Hafiz before, or I'll just finish it off. I know him, Dr. Hafiz for the past uh, two and a half decades, more than 20 years. Uh, he's young and dynamic when compared to both of us, myself and Dr. P.G. Paul. And he's also adventurous and chivalrous like three musketers. 
and uh, he has good sense of reasoning and has modified many endoscopic procedures uh, to his liking. I think the pinnacle he reached was in AAGL, must be five years ago at Orlando, when there was a live telecast of a large uterus in which he did a total laparoscopic hysterectomy, and it was broadcasted live uh, to the uh, American Association of Gynec Laparoscopy uh, meeting. He has set up a brand name of Sunrise Group of Hospitals in India and abroad, and uh, he has trained many endoscopists and enjoys fanfare in India as well as UAE and uh, abroad. And uh, he is, has many innovations, experimentations in his work. And a person who ca you can call any time for a workshop or for a conference. He is always committed to that and he makes it a point to attend. With these few words, I would like to ask Dr. P.G. Paul to start the first talk on management, endoscopic management of uh, Mullerian anomaly, especially on cervical atresia, which uh, you have some experience. Dr. Paul, please. Thank you, Jay Krishnan, uh, for reminding our uh, good old days where we are all uh, going for conferences, learning new things in each conference and trying to practice uh, in our day-to-day uh, -day practice and that's how we have uh, come to this level. Uh, as Jay Krishnan mentioned, uh, I don't have many cases uh, come across during this uh, my practice because it's quite uh, a rare uh, anomaly but very difficult to treat. This is uh, probably one in one lakh or little less than that, the cervical, pure cervical malformations do occur. Little bit of the cervical malformations we normally come across. Uh, the one I have come across both were cervical agenesis and uh, the other ones described are uh, Fragmentation of the cervix, you can see on the picture. Fragmentation of the cervix, fibrous cord where it's not canalized, uh, just uh, obstruction. These are the two common types. And uh, most of the cervical agenesis or most of these cervical anomalies are associated with uh, other anomalies like Cervical agenesis is associated with almost 75% of them do not have a vagina, vaginal aplasia, compared to the cervical dysgenesis, where a uh, majority of the cases do have a normal vagina. So we can uh, we can say that if you have a cervical agenesis, you have to do multiple procedures to achieve your uh, endpoint. Uh, the main Symptom is uh, nobody can um, uh, no, nobody can ignore the symptoms because the obstructive symptoms are so paralyzing the the young girl will be in real agony and uh, another added problem is if this is going on for some time this obstructive phenomena is going on majority will have endometriosis because of the retrograde uh, menstruation and. The clinical suspicion is, although it's rare, any obstructive anomaly should have a good evaluation. Ultrasonography may not, can guide you, but the actual abnormality can be diagnosed on MRI. So whenever you suspect it's not a straightforward, a straightforward anomaly, uh, I think uh, MRI is going to give us more information for a good plan of management. This is uh, a 36 year old uh, Nalli Gravida. He had laparotomy, hysterotomy, cervical vaginal reconstruction. And uh, she had a laparoscopic cervical reconstruction in 2004 and uh, multiple surgeries. And this is what you see now. So we did a cystoscopy and we could identify already there is uh, a fistulous opening. The uretric openings were clearly seen. So our aim was, uh, this patient was planned for hysterectomy because uh, every treatment has failed. He has gone through multiple surgeries and you can see that uh, you can hardly see the uterus and adnexa because of complete 
uh, it's engulfing their complete addition. So it was a uh, quite tough case to identify the landmark. And uh, we first released the anti-DSFS because the bladder has to be released completely because she has a vesicouterine fistula, which also has to be corrected in this case. She has not only obstructed vagina, obstructed cervix, all the reconstruction was done twice. Uh, this is uh, a small probe. Even vagina was uh, reconstructed, but they are all closed. I know it is still difficult to follow this uh, anatomy. <clears throat> so uh, now we identified the uterines and divided the uterines on both sides. Slightly older video, I have done it uh, many years back. And when we opened the vagina, it's not really the new vagina. You can see that uh, the old uh, IUD, which was kept for the patency, is uh, still remaining, although the external vagina was actually closed down. So we almost uh, completed the hysterectomy. And uh, on the right side, we could conserve the ovary, but salpingectomy was done. So our next thing was to identify the fistula. You can see it's a very quite small. She has uh, actually menorrhea only during the menses. So we clearly identified, and uh, few ruptured sutures were kept and closed. The patient made a good recovery, and her. Uh, uh, fistula was also closed and there was no leakage of urine. So we, we now, that's why many surgeons still believe a hysterectomy may be the best option because the patient has to go through multiple surgeries and a lot, a re-occlusion of the cervix and vagina is a, a major uh, complication that do occur. So in this particular case, uh, if you are planning for a conservative surgery, you need a new vagina reconstruction, cervical reconstruction, and literature says the uh, different way of doing reconstructing the cervix with uh, the graft, skin graft, peritoneal graft, almost uh, every variety of uh, grafts have been tried uh, to reconstruct the cervical canal to avoid re-occlusion. Uh, now the consensus is it's better to perform two-step procedure. First, the vaginal reconstruction, and second, the cervical reconstruction. This is uh, a recent case. Uh, now it's one and a half years old uh, surgery. This patient uh, presented. And uh, the classification gets into this. A 15-year-old girl with cyclic abdominal pain since two years, she was uh, moderately built and the secondary sexual characters were normal. There was no vagina. This is a trans-subdominal sonography showing hematometra and right ovary and hematosalpinx was done. An MRI was also done, which says there is hematometra, absent cervix, absent vagina, and uh, hematosalpinx plus a left rudimentary horn. So the plan was a laparoscopic assisted new cervical vaginal reconstruction. You can see the hematometra, you can see the hematosalpinx. The uterus is actually quite enlarged, a lot of endometriosis and inflammatory blebs you can see. So our first aim was to decompress the uterus and uh, we made a small incision on the fundus and we extended a little more, and you can actually see the laparoscopic view of the uterine cavity showing very bumpy biomaterial bulges, suggestive of adenomyosis. And uh, the next step was reconstruction of the vagina. We thought this patient, if you use a graft or something which needs constant dilatation, this girl may not oblige. So we thought it's better to use the iminal remnants itself, the 
for reconstructing the vagina and if at all she needs uh, the future vagin recon. So the space was created between like any other surgery and laparoscopically the bladder was peritoneum was incised and the bladder was uh, pushed down over the uterus where you probably want to make the now we passed an instrument a grasper there was no cervix so we have to actually uh, go through the new vagina we created and we can see that is the new cervix we artificially made we put an alias forceps and uh, enlarge it sufficiently to avoid uh, occlusion and the new cervix was uh, held with again the grasper is coming down through the uterine lower uterine segment a foley's catheter was now pulled up and laparoscopically you pulled out of the wound and uh, you can see the poly is exiting through into the neo vagina. The neo cervix was uh, enlarged because it's thick muscular wall and already because of the hematometra long standing two years long standing hematometra the walls were so thickened and it was not that easy but you can see that now a clearly uh, a good cervical opening was created we made sure uh, at least uh, the instruments passed and uh, sutures were taken from the new cervix we created and they were all uh, held long to be sutured with the hymenal region so the uh, we made a t shaped incision on the vestibule and this was used to actually uh, suture directly to the cervix steps are uh, actually straightforward only thing is we have to take the bites and sutures you could actually create now coming back to the laparoscopic view we pulled out the polis and uh, we know that a polis bulb will not get retained so we sutured with uh, a vicryl because uh, we knew that vicryl will remain there for uh, 30 to 40 days which is sufficient for the epithelialization of the cervical canal and then the uterine cavity was closed with a few sutures this was the initial incision we made on the fundus of the uterus to drain the hematometra now you can see the hydrosalpins uh, we thought of uh, excising this rather than repairing because at the moment the primary concern was relieving her symptoms and to establish a normal menstruation or it was normal now you can see there is a rudimentary horn on the left side this is a uniconvoid uterus and the left rudimentary horn which was uh, not canalized so we kept a foley's catheter and uh, intravaginal small plastic mold and the plastic mold was removed on fourth postoperative day and the patient was taught to use this small pipette bulb this uh, IVF or IUA catheter uh, we use this one and the police catheter was expelled after 21 days and she, days. And she resumed the mattress you can see the sound after one month the uterus has become smaller smaller so some echoing is there and now after the eight months you can see the uterus has become, like and this is the 
Neo, Vagina, and uh, Tigra, almost 5 cm. Uh, I think this video is uh, available in uh, JMX uh, video article. And the common complications are, I already mentioned, endometritis is one common complication, PID, and uh, it's, it can be uh, very risky to have uh, deeper dissection causing bowel and bladder injuries and retinosis is the one which we are all uh, concerned about. Uh, regarding a little bit of pathogenesis, by nine weeks, the urogenital sinus, the sinovaginal bulb, want get uh, vacuolization and by 17 to 18 weeks, the actual uh, cervical canal and vagina is formed. Uh, uh, just to mention about uh, the genetic basis, now all of us know that many of the abnormalities are not due to the real genetic reason, they are because of the epigenetic modification. That means that there is no DNA sequence difference in epigenetic modifications, only its expressions are changed by either external or other situations. And this group of genes are called the Hox genes, and the wingless type genes are responsible probably for the Mullerian anomalies. So the explanation given to this type of anomalies are they are hypothesized to cause defect in the Mullerian effective tract development by interfering with the cell migration during the organogenesis because of this epi genetic modifications happening. Uh, there have been very few reports of pregnancies following these cases, and uh, there is a uh, Rasai group in 2014. They did eight cases and two were live births. And the next series, none other than our BN Chakravarti 2000. He had done 18 cases and reported two live births. Another from India, Prabhulani also had done five cases and she reported two pregnancies, but they end up in abortions. And uh, very few scandi, one or two more uh, pregnancies are being reported. So to summarize, congenital cervical malformations are rare and they cause severe obstructive symptoms cyclically. And the diagnosis is suspicion clinically, followed by ultrasonography and MRI will confirm what exactly the type of malformations. And you always come across some form of associated anomalies like vaginal aplasia or urinary tract anomalies. And uh, all patients need not undergo hysterectomy, utero-vaginal anastomosis is possible. If vagina is not developed, a two-step procedure may be a better option. And uh, the complications you must think of, and there are case reports where they have lost the patient following infections. So, in complications, still uh, you have to consider before planning for a surgery or counseling the patient. So, thank you for the at patient attention. Thank you, Jai Krishnan, uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Paul, uh, for uh, an excellent presentation on a very rare case. Usually, hysterectomy was the mode of treatment. Nowadays, we find that uh, with the help of plastic surgeons, also people are doing reconstructive operations. And glad to know that endoscopic approach is also accomplished. And we'll take the questions towards the end of the three talks. And now I like to call upon Dr. Hafiz, Hafiz Rahman on uh, uh, total laparoscopic hysterectomy, a difficult situation. So as all of you know, laparoscopic hysterectomy or hysterectomy today is one of the uh, commonest uh, surgeries in uh, gynecology, uh, maybe next to episiotomy and sterilization. And um, uh, this is something which uh, most of the uh, doctors are interested. And today we have reached a stage that uh, almost 100% of the uh, hysterectomies are either done vaginally or uh, laparoscopically. 
so when jay krishnan got this topic for me i thought we should uh, bring in cases where uh, it will be of advantage to the uh, doctors who are developing this um, uh, technique to beyond a little uh, uh, higher level so that they can uh, do these cases even if there are certain uh, issues so we will just go through the uh, issues one of the most important thing is a large size uterus as you can see here this is a pretty large size uterus here where uh, towards the lateral side not hit the falciform in a large size uterus one of the most important thing is where the primary trochar is and where the secondary trochar is mostly you put the primary trochar much higher but when it comes to the secondary trochar you should understand that the secondary trochars are put just above the attachment of the ligaments because many a times what happens is in a very large size uterus you will find that the ligament attachments are in the pelvis so the secondary trochars are put just above the attachment of the ligaments and not really correlating with the primary trochar now in a large size uterus you should understand that it is actually much more easier than the usual uh, uterus to do the surgery the most difficult part will be to actually remove the specimen out of the uh, out of the uh, abdominal cavity rather than doing the surgery here we are just showing the sunrise method of uh, hysterectomy this is the same surgery which uh, jayakrishnan has told that we had uh, a live relate to las vegas few years back you can see how the uh, sir, how the uh, bladder is reflected and i'll just uh, go a bit fast on this so you can see that we are using a ligature nowadays actually uh, we have completely stopped using the normal uh, bipolar it's uh, because uh, we are pretty convinced that the post operative morbidity is much much lesser when we use harmonic and ligature and complications also are much lesser and it is very easy to train our students on ligature and harmonic rather than on uh, usual bipolar and uh, unipolar so as you can see you can see how it is um, uh, we usually open one side completely before we go to the other side and this has obvious uh, advantages when you go to the other side now coming to uh, uteruses where there is a previous c section and uh, you have an additions to the you have additions to the uh, of the bladder to the uh, cervix here what you can see is i'll just show you this one uh, here uh, before that i'll just uh, go to the uh, this video to see how a normal dissection occurs you can see here the this is the usual bladder fold dissection the there is a beautiful plane between the cervix and the urinary bladder and this plane opens up usually when you pull the bladder upwards here we are just cutting the round ligament also when you pull the bladder upwards this plane usually opens up and you can see that there is a, there is a nice plane here and once you enter into this plane correctly it is not difficult as you can see here either you are damaging the cervix or you are not damaging the bladder also and it is not difficult it is not actually difficult to reflect the bladder but many times in cases of previous cesarean what happens is see here patient this will be the usual picture you can also open the uh, bladder fold in many cases from the center but not always it will be possible to open the bladder fold from the center as you can see here i'm just uh, trying to open it from the center but you can see the bladder muscles are seen so whenever you open it from here you should straight go into the cervical muscles rather than the bladder muscle i don't know whether you understand you to identify the cut on the bladder musculature and the muscle fibers have to be identified once you identify this muscle fibers then do not go in the center 
you have to take a lateral path. The advantage of the lateral path is usually with cesarean, you suture the bladder to the center and laterally there will be always a window. So how do we take the lateral window? See, it is like this. You can lift up the bladder. Here we are just abandoning this uh, thing and you are going laterally. You can see the origin or you can see the uterine artery. So just above the uterine artery, you will find a nice window and you can do a combined uh, sharp and blunt dissection as you can see and identify the cervical tissue. Can you see that? You can clearly identify the cervical tissue, leave the upper part, just identify cervical tissue and go down and you can see how much of the upper part is adherent here. Once you know this plane and you have the upper plane and you have the lower plane, then it is much more easier to cut in between as you can see here. You can see how nicely we can just flush to the cervix and cut it because you have identified the lower part and you have identified the upper part so that you are quite sure that you are not cutting into the bladder rather you are cutting between the uh, cervix and the bladder and where it is adherent so that you can nicely uh, do it here and uh, remove the bladder from the cervix and then the hysterectomy can proceed in the uh, normal way as you can see here. You can just push the bladder down and you can see a nice plane there, a completely avascular plane. You have to identify the tissue. One of the most important thing is each and every tissue has to be identified. Then only you can actually get into this correct plane and get a proper avascular uh, plane. These are not cases where vasopressin is given, but you can see the avascularity when you go in the correct uh, plane as such. Now, not only anterior, you will see the same lateral window posteriorly also. Sometimes you find that the rectum is completely adherent. As you can see here, you can see that it's a completely adherent uterus like a frozen pelvis. And the same plane of the fat and the cervix and vagina can be found posteriorly also. See that? This is the lateral posterior plane where you can dissect before you are taking the rectal um, rectal additions above. See, the rectum is completely adherent above here. And you can see how the lateral plane opens up very nicely. Can you see that? Because this is not the adherent area. This is the non-adherent area. This is the normal area. So you can see the vagina there, the normal vagina there. And once you see that, then it is much easier for you to go in. Like this, you can just uh, keep cutting, keep cutting close to the uh, cervix. Because here, I know there is vagina here. The tissue looks like exactly like vagina. So you know exactly when you will open up. See this whitish tissue here that is cervix. So you have actually dissected anteriorly and you have dissected posteriorly, but you still have the rectal additions on top, like the bladder additions on top. And you can go ahead and uh, open the vagina as you can see here. And once vagina is open, then you can actually do a retrograde hysterectomy. You can go back retrograde. Yeah, you can see here exactly where the vagina is. And you can open it and then retrograde, you can go and release the uh, bowel additions, which will be much more easier actually than doing the bowel addition and then coming back to the rectovaginal uh, plane. So here on again, you might see something like this, like a cervical or a broad ligament fibroid. One thing with the cervical and broad ligament fibroid is that Never try to go around the cervical fibroid and do the procedure. Neither do not enucleate the cervical fibroid from the uterus. It will unnecessarily bleed unless you have given vasopressin. But enucleate the cervical fibroid from the broad ligament or its area there so that it will be much easier. If you, try, if you do not enucleate it and then try to go around the cervical fibroid, there is all chance of injuring the, uter injuring the ureter. See here, I am just opening the peritoneum. I am not opening the musculature or this pattern of the cervix. We're just opening the peritoneum, keeping the ureter by the side, and then pulling it out. Can you see that? And most of the cases, it is very avascular. Most of the cases, it will be avascular because these are fibroids growing into the broad ligament, 
and most of the case almost all cases it will be very avascular you can see that there is not much of uh, uh, bleeding and once you have enucleated it out of the broad ligament or enucleated it out of the normal cervical position it will be much more easier to do the hysterectomy as such as you can see here now coming to uterus when it is stuck to the anterior abdominal wall in many cases of post cesarean i will just show you a complication which can happen this is not actually a complication this is a yusuf syndrome but it's almost similar when the uterus is stuck like this completely to the anterior abdominal wall and this is actually the only case where you cannot do a vaginal hysterectomy or rather it will be very difficult to do a vaginal hysterectomy even frozen pelvis you can easily do a vaginal hysterectomy there is no issue with the additions but this kind of addition where the uterus is pulled up and stuck to the anterior abdominal wall are cases where we find it much more difficult to do in this case one of the most important thing is go laterally first go laterally first and then cut the lateral ligaments first and then only go in the center to release the bladder now one of the most important thing you should understand is that when you go in the center what is going to happen is first you will reach the bladder either you will go above the bladder or you will go into the bladder or you will go below the bladder so it's very important to understand these three planes so going above the bladder you can actually start studying the fascia when you see the fascia in the richest space or the fascia above the bladder you will understand that you have actually got above the bladder into the bladder also when you go only the upper part will be fibrotic as you can see here you can see the upper part will be fibrotic and rest of the area will not be fibrotic and it will be very loose so here we are actually uh, deliberately going into the bladder because it's a yusuf syndrome it's a fistula as you can see here see here this is the area where you should go in a normal dissection this is the area where you should go here but in this case we just wanted to open into the bladder see this is the way it will come you can see little distended bladder here and See, this is this is what it can happen if you do not go in the correct plane if you do not go you can open into the bladder so you have to go a little down here so that you will not open into the bladder so this is the most important thing here you can see the fistula there that is a fistula you can see here and you have to repair the fistula anyway it's a different uh, topic altogether now when it comes to bowel addition how do you uh, uh, tackle bowel addition bowel addition has to be tackled very boldly until and unless you tackle this boldly and properly in the proper plane you will not be able to actually successfully do the surgery what happened is i remember in my younger days people used to say that you sacrifice the uterus don't touch the bowel you take a small part of the uterus with the bowel never do that this is my advice and this is my method i'm not telling uh, all of you should follow it but this is the way i do we do in the correct plane always when you have this kind of bowel addition inject vasopressin when you inject vasopressin in these cases you will find that the bowel addition will get loosened a little and this loosening take advantage of that loose plane and you can be very clear and be bold and sharp cutting do not use any energy sources you will find that as and when you cut and pull the bowel out keep the tension you will find nice planes like this can you see that you will find beautiful planes like this be bold and sharp and cut it see we are not cutting into the uterus even though it went in then you are cutting outside and if you keep cutting into the uterus you will find that the additions are never ending you are going on and and you will find it will never end as such see here you see the bowel can be removed even though it was completely under and then you will always find an end to this addition some areas will be completely free and very easy some areas will be under and so never get into the principle of leaving a part of the uterus with the bowel you will not be successful in your surgery always you will keep doing like that and uh, really it will be much much more difficult 
in some cases uh, when you do this kind of uh, uh, you know techniques as such now when it comes to rectal additions posteriorly also see here you can see the uh, these are this was a case where you saw that uh, uh, opening of the vagina so after that you can see that see you can see the uh, rectum which is adherent above so in these cases you can see the fat so go always above the fat fat belongs to the rectum as you can see so with the scissors some blunt dissection you can boldly go until and unless you do these dissections boldly you will keep on doing it and you will never end up properly you can see that we are just cutting and going nothing happens but at the same time you should know your planes you should know what you are cutting each and every step you should know what you are cutting see you can see that there is a bowel and you can see the tissue and you can see we are cutting and going very clearly see that and the tension you have to keep the tension live the tension when it is live it will come out very easily and the planes open up small small cuts will make the planes open up you can see that see that that's a plane getting opened up and you can see the bowel going down very nicely see that so this is the way it has to be done don't do in very very small uh, uh, cuts you get into the correct plane and never cut into the uterus whether it is bladder or bowel to dissect these uh, things you learn doing in the correct plane which is much more uh, easier bleeding is one thing which we always have to tackle and uh, after vasopressin and bilateral uh, internal iliac clipping has come the bleeding rates have reduced drastically vasopressin can be used in hysterectomies also there is no problem at all in using vasopressin in hysterectomies previously we used to think that uh, it will bleed post operatively it doesn't bleed post operatively the theory behind this is basically if you have the vessels which are cut shrunken and stop bleeding for 40 45 minutes there will be a clot which is formed and this clot will usually not get dislodged only the large vessels which will bleed and those large vessels we are specifically coagulating or taking care of it when we do the hysterectomy now the ureter is one of the most important structure all of us are scared when it comes to a difficult hysterectomy and here you can see the uh, ureter i just show you the normal anatomy what happens to the ureter here you can see the ureter goes below the uterine artery you can see the uterine artery going above and you can see the nice ureter moving and this is the cervix you can see here this is the cervix you are going to cut here this close to the ureter when you cut the mecanrods ligament these are the ligament anterior and posterior part of mecanrods ligament you can see the uterine vein going down can you see the uterine vein so that is the uterine vein going down and this is the uterine artery so you are going to cut here see this way you are going to cut you can see how close this is so it's very important to save this ureter in all cases so how do we save the ureter whether it is adherent or whether it is non adherent what you have to basically do is do not take the lateral ureter first here i'm just showing the anatomy this is a radical hysterectomy patient this is not what i'm talking now do not take the lateral ureter first what you have to basically uh, do is just uh, what you have to basically do is ureter has in the lower part three courses one is very close to the one course is very close to the uterocecal ligament so initially when you cut the uterocecal ligament what happens is the posterior course of ureter falls down then you have a lateral course through the ligament of mecanrods ligament which cannot be actually shifted laterally until you cut the mecanrods ligament that you leave it then go ahead and dissect the anterior fold with the bladder what happens when you dissect the anterior fold with the bladder what will happen is basically the anterior course of ureter because ureter goes lateral to the cervix and then turns towards the midline and then enters the bladder so that turning anteriorly will again fall down so ureter has fall down posteriorly ureter has fallen down anteriorly and then laterally alone can be isolated and there if you are using a ligature or a harmonic it will be much safer for the ureter because the ureter is just 1 cm away from the cervix 
and this will be much safer no doubt about it that's why we have stopped using bipolar in that area at all because bipolar always has a one centimeter lateral spread not everybody can use it like what dr paul does he does it in small small spurts so that he is not getting that one centimeter uh, spread of the bipolar current to damage the uh, ureter but at the same time there can be cases where the ureter can be completely adherent also as you can see here in those cases where you find that the ureter is adherent down first you go and take the ureterocycle that is the first thing which you do this is the internal iliac and here down is the ureter you can see so you go and take the ureterocycle first here you have clipped the internal iliac uh, uh, artery so that they are not bleeding and once you take, cut the ureterocycle then what you can do is you can go and isolate the infundibulopelvic ligament if you are taking out the ovary now when you isolate the infundibulopelvic ligament then ureter comes into vision so you are seeing the ureter and going down as you can see here the you are seeing the ureter can you see the ureter here this is the ureter see this is the ureter here so you are seeing the ureter at every cut every step you catch the infundibulopelvic ligament see the ureter going down also you catch the see can you see the ureter here you can see the ureter very clearly so at every step you are seeing the ureter and going you can see posteriorly also it's adherent you can see the ureter going down here it's completely you can see the ovary completely adherent but you are going in the correct plane see this is the ureter and this is the rectum so you are going in the correct plane and dissecting it becomes actually very easy you can see the planes will open up very nicely when you go down because you are in the correct plane the moment you lose your plane and you go in the wrong plane you will find that throughout there is addition the additions never stop the correct plane will allow the additions to stop because lower down there may not be additions and it will be much more uh, easier many times so this for this you have to go in the correct plane this is the anterior where you can see you can see the step which i have described as uh, before this is the anterior so you dissect the anterior as you can see you dissect the bladder down and uh, if the ureter is adherent you have to dissect the anterior course of the ureter as you can see here it is dissecting the anterior course of the ureter you can see the uterine artery the bladder is always just above the uterine artery this is the uterine artery here the bladder is just above the uterine artery and when you go down here so you dissect the anterior and posterior and then go down and open the vagina it will be much more uh, easier this to now coming to cases where there are generalized addition as you can see it is much more easier to uh, uh, stop the bleeding if you want to do additionalizes very nicely as you can see here where there are uh, generalized addition completely what you do is you inject vasopressin you inject vasopressin you will find that the additions are much more looser because the vasopressin will go into the addition with two advantages you can see that the bowel is completely stuck there so the vasopressin will go into the uterus with two into the addition with two advantages one is it will loosen the additions once it loosens the additions it will become avascular also so it's much easier to go in the correct plane you can see that see we are going the exactly correct plane so that it becomes uh, much more easier as you can see here so this avascular Vascularity when you do this additionalizes is much more uh, uh, better. And another thing is in these I do not most so the I do not always better to use a myoma screw for manipulation because you can actually manipulate the uterus in such a way and give good traction to these additions when you do it. You can see this is the uterus and you can see the level of bladder and bowel additions which are there. but you can see that these can be easily managed and in these cases most of these cases it is better to do an bilateral internal iliac ligation in these cases so that there will be absolutely no bleeding as you can see here 
and you can see that the uh, ureter is just going into that uh, additions and you can dissect it down nicely that is the bowel here and that is the anterior dissection it's all stuck in those areas due to multiple infection and endometriosis even we have had a lot of cases where multiple laparotomies was done. We recently had a case, uh, uh, I think one year back or something, we had a case where five laparotomies were done and could not do the hysterectomy. Not, not done. But the hysterectomy, it was referred and we found that laparoscopically it is actually much more easier because this visualization of the planes, as you can see here, it's not that easy sometimes in uh, open surgery. Laparoscopically, you see a predictive anatomy. You can see through these additions, and it is actually sometimes much more easier. As you can see here, you can just cut and go inside uh, these additions, these bowel additions. You can see it is actually uh, uh, this is actually a case where there is a, a fistula. This is a dermoid cyst, and you can see the fistula of the dermoid into the Powell. So we have done this complete removal and we have uh, uh, repaired that fistula also. It's not a bowel injury actually, it's a fistula. And you can see how nicely the additions can be done and it is completely vascular because of these three things. The right plane, the vasopressin and the bilateral internal iliac ligation. And you can see that once you go in the right plane, later on you will open up as you can see here and it will be much more easier to do these uh, uh, procedures. So it's, it's, it's actually much more easier when you do it laparoscopically than what you can actually achieve open. Only thing is you have to stick on to the right procedure and you can see how the vagina is open, how the pulling is very good with the myoma screw and it becomes much more easier as you can see that is a posterior and you can uh, very clearly uh, do it much more easier. So thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, Hafiz. Uh, that shows how experienced you are in dealing with difficulties. And uh, I think the audience appre would appreciate uh, your dealing with various problems encountered during uh, total laparoscopic hysterectomy. I would like to tell the audience uh, to uh, just uh, put down your questions and the answers will be replied at the end of the uh, uh, next talk. Please be there and just put down your questions so that we can discuss with Dr. Paul Hafiz and my talk which follows. And I am now moving on to adenomyomectomy. Uh, and uh, the problems encountered, how to differentiate adenomyomectomy and fibroids. What are the problems encountered in suturing? And uh, what are the outcomes following adenomyomectomy? We all know that adenomyosis is a benign uterine disorder and is considered as a specific entity in palm coin FIGO classification of abnormal uterine bleeding. So it belongs to the palm coin FIGO classification of, the, of abnormal uterine bleeding. And the most important theory which has come into play is the role of tissue injury and repair that is known as the tire as the primary mechanism for myometrial invasion has been hypothesized. The chronic peristaltic myometric contraction may induce continuous micro trauma to the junctional zone causing inflammation, which in turn promotes local estrogen production and induces a very vicious cycle. So the new theory for the onset of adenomyosis is the role of tissue injury and repair, known as a tire mechanism, which has been hypothesized. And this results in a positive feedback mechanism and leads to a chronic hyperperistalsis in the junction zone, which promotes uh, we have the junction of promoting repeated cycles of autotraumatization. So the tire theory stresses the importance of tissue damage to the endometrial myometrial surface. And this has been hypothesized as the cause 
of the pathology following that. Looking into the epidemiological data, adenomyosis is associated with large number of births, spontaneous and induced abortions, and endometrial hyperplasia are also related to the increased risk of adenomyosis. The risk factors associated are endometriosis, smoking, surgical trauma, as well as injuries to the uterus, such as cesarean section, curettage, as well as myomectomies. The diagnosis is usually done by a transvaginal ultrasound, and it should be considered as a primary diagnostic tool. We find heterogeneous hypoechoic poorly described areas in the biometrium, varying in size, with or without anechoic lacunae or cyst of varying size. So it is heterogeneous and hypoechogenic, poorly described areas. The second feature is a linear striation which radiates out from the endometrium into the myometrium. And the third finding you should look for is a poor definition of the junction zone. And associated with this, we have a pseudo widening of the endometrium. An enlargement of the uterus occurs with asymmetric thickening of the anterior, either the anterior or the posterior, but most commonly we find it on the posterior wall. So adenomyosis is most diagnosed in the presence of three or more criteria in ultrasound. So these are the pictures of the adenomyosis. You find the heterogeneous hypoequivalations, poorly defined junction zone. Here you find there is not much thickening of the anterior posterior wall. Here you can find the, lac the small sister lacunae seen in the cavities. And we, should, we can uh, put on the Doppler and find increased vascularity also. If you have a 3D ultrasound, it is good enough to identify the junctional zone. It is ill-defined. And normally you find the junctional zone is also increased. And you find that margin, margin is uh, not well-defined as in a normal case. So at least two of the described ultrasound feature, when it was present, the accuracy of diagnosing adenomyosis was 90 percentage. Magnetic resonance imaging and TBS are equally good in identifying patients with adenomyosis, but MRI was superior to TBS to exclude the diagnosis of adenomyosis with equal sensitivity, but you find there is a higher specificity in MRI. So this is an MRI picture which shows the enlarged uterus. This wall is anterior wall is slightly uh, thicker than the posterior wall. You can find echo dense areas. The endometrium is thin, so the junctional zone is not clearly defined in this picture. This is also a sagittal view, which shows the uterus is enlarged. You have the bladder here, so this is the posterior zone. A heterogeneous lesion in the posterior zone, ill defined borders, and you find lacunae or small cyst in the uh, myometrium, and Doppler showing an increased uh, vasculature. The rectum may be adherent posteriorly, and you have to look for the addition surrounding the uterus. Looking for the accuracy and sensitivity of uh, transvaginal ultrasound and 3D ultrasound, if you have a 2D ultrasound, the accuracy is 83 percentage. If you have uh, 3D ultrasound, it is 89, whereas sensitivity, you find it is 75 percentage with 2D ultrasound, with a 3D ultrasound, it is 91 percentage. Overall, you find that the MRI has got high specificity and possibility of adenomyosis found in MRI, correctly diagnosis is as high as more than 90 percentage. The MRI is a hallmark in the final diagnosis of uh, adenomyosis, even though 2D and 3D also are quietly are also good enough for the initial screening. Coming to the surgical or histological classification, we broadly classify in the diffuse adenomyosis, focal adenomyoma. Now here we have varieties like polypoidal adenomyosis, especially inside the uterine cavity. And we also have special categories like adenomyosis of the endocervical type and retroperitoneal adenomyosis or rectovaginal adenomyosis, according to Grimbis's Infertility Sterility 2013. Coming to pregnancy, achieving pregnancy after medical or surgical therapy is always a question to think of. In this, in this slide, you find medical therapy has been given with GnRH analogs. The various authors have uh, given the numbers. 
I take into the larger number, Wang et al. Number is 37, 37 of the adenomatic patients were given GNRH analog for six months. And look at the cumulative pregnancy rate at the end of three years. It is only 10.8 percentage. That is four out of 37. And the cumulative three year successful delivery rate is also on the lower range, 8.1 percentage. And when you look at the JAMA et al. group, 22 patients treated with GNRH for six months and he couldn't achieve much pregnancy. He had spontaneous abortion in one, ectopic in one, and a vaginal term delivery in one patient. So just emphasizes the fact that giving GNRH analogs alone does not give you much of a uh, results regarding the reproductive outcome. You may get a temporary relief if you get GNRH analog. Once you stop the GNRH analog, the patient doesn't become pregnant. The adenomyces recurs. The newer drug in the armamentarium is Dinogest. Dinogest reduces proliferation, nerve growth of factor expression, and nerve fiber density in human adenomyces, according to these Japanese authors. This study demonstrates that adenomyces treated with Dinogest showed remarkable histological features such as reduction in proliferation, the nerve growth factor expression, nerve fiber density, and the local findings indicate the impact on Dinogest on the histological events and explains its therapeutic effect on adenomyosis. And this infertility sterility 2017 Osuga group, the efficacy of Dinogest, the treatment of painful symptoms, a randomized controlled trial. The conclusion was Dinogest is effective, well tolerated for treatment of painful symptoms associated with adenomyosis, not complicated by severe uterine enlargement or severe anemia. Now we move on to the surgical aspects. It is a uterus sparing surgery for adenomyosis. You can have a complete excision of adenomyosis known as adenomyomectomy. Or whenever you, or you can go for a cystectomy using the classic technique. The adenomyomectomy is explained as a classic technique. The modifications are the U-shaped suturing, the overlapping flaps, and the triple flap method by Osada, which he described in 2011. Or you have a partial excision, which is known as a cytoreductive surgery or partial adenomyomectomy, where the, when it's localized, you go for a partial adenomyomectomy, which you can have the classical technique, a transverse H incision, the wedge resection of the uterus, which Dr. Hafiz usually uh, demonstrates in his workshops, as well as an asymmetric dissection of the uterus. These are the various subvariants of partial adenomyomectomy. One thing regarding the uterus sparing operative treatment is the classical technique, laparoscopic adenomyomectomy, has got the same steps as myomectomy. But one thing you have to keep in mind, the adenomyosis doesn't have any defined borders. It is highly vascular. And sometimes when you cut the adenomyosis, you should know the difference between the adenomyotic tissue and the healthy myometrium. You should not excise the healthy myometrium. And the last important thing, the approximation can be difficult. So if you are over enthusiastic, you go deep into the adenomyotic layers and you are not able to define the borders, you create a large crater. That crater has to be closed. You can't leave the crater open and you find that it's promoting a rupture of the uterus. So this is highlighted by Grimbius Infertility Sterility 2014. And coming to localized adenomyosis, this patient had a localized adenomyosis, and this was a loss of the uterus, and Uh, 20 units in 200 ml and uh, we are putting a transverse incision with uh, a harmonic case uh, just like a fibroid you find that uh, the cleavage is not good there is no capsule sometimes you are caught unawares especially when you deal with uh, adenomyosis which the sonologist has reported as fibroid uterus the margins are the same 
but here we are incising about half a centimeter away or one centimeter away from the serosa leaving behind the healthy tissue and creating a plane so that you can excise the thickened hardened tissue and here also the posterior incision has been completed anteriorly also you have to incise the adenomyoma about half centimeter one centimeter away and uh, you have to create a plane and excise the tissue how far to excise you when you do a proper surgery a cytorotective surgery you have to excise till the normal tissue is seen if you do a partial adenomyomectomy you find the symptoms recur and doesn't benefit the patient and you find the reproductive outcomes are quite bad enough here you find once uh, uh, you have incised it a major chunk to make the procedure a little more faster uh, and variant technique is being used a monopolar cautery is being used but usage of the monocolor cautery as it shown you find there is a lot of smoke and fumes you should have a smoke evacuator in the present circumstances and once you reach the base uh, you find you can excise often i find adenomatic tissue or very thick tissues and the bleeding are less not classically uh, told as the bleeding is in excess you find fibrous more of fibrous tissue and you find the bleeding is uh, slightly less in number and here you find you reach you have to excise the tissue as long as it reaches into the uh, or sometimes you find the cavity is open and even if you open the cavity there is no problem in that the major aim will be to remove the adenomatic tissue till you see the healthy myometrium don't excise the healthy myometrium and even if you open the cavity you have to put a couple of stitches and here you find the adenomatic tissue is almost excised and Stitched it. This is a special type of stitches, the mattress, the interrupted mattress stitches we take for endometriosis. You have to take a deep stitch right to the base, and you have to do a mattress stitch where you take the superficial layers also. This type of sutures helps you uh, to prevent uh, what you call the cutting through of the uh, what you call the myometrium. Usually the tissue is friable. When you go for the regular continuous sutures or with Sometimes you find cutting through happens. So this stitch, this type of suturing can be taken. So the principle will be to go to the base first. Then you take the needle out. Again, you pull the thread and go to the superficial myometal tissue and take it from the other side also. And uh, you can have a good approximation. You're not leaving behind dead spaces and you find you're approximating the uh, these are the interrupted stitches which one can take for closure. If you go over the regular technique as used in myometomy, sometimes you find that you are cutting off the myometrium, it just uh, clips off, and all these uh, interrupted stitches helps to uh, restore the myometrium, and you find that the bulge is gone. You can use a morselator to cut the myometrial, the, the adenomyotic tissue, and then you can you put the interseed and leave behind a drain sometimes some sort of collection do occur in the first 24 hours you can remove the drain uh, the next day and you find that the patient makes a complete recovery and uh, coming we i'm going to show you four videos over here and uh, different types of videos i would just uh, like to share Check the vasopressin till there is blanching of the blanching of the myometrium. Here I'm putting an oblique incision because there's slight extension from the posterior wall to the anterior wall. So you can put a oblique incision, and I am an ipsilateral suturing person. So you can excise the adenomatic tissue. Be bold enough. 
it's a cytoreductive surgery you have to excise the adenomatic tissue till you see the healthy normal tissue and sometimes you may reach up to the cavity don't be afraid reaching the cavity you have to put the subendometrial stitch once you incised about a half a centimeter one centimeter away from the serosa you excise the adenomatic tissue there is no cleavage as in myoma you have to excise the tissue uh, remove as much as possible and come back later and remove the small bits which are left behind as you know see that it's maybe due to the effect of vasopressin sometimes fibrous tissue bleeds less quite to the contrary what is reported in the literature that the bleeding is much more and uh, cytoreductive surgery excises the whole tissue and uh, till you see a normal tissue so it is easy when it is posterior anteriorly or when the adenomyosis is just extending anterior and posterior an oblique incision is quite good enough so once you have removed we find that there is little more adenomatic tissue in the upper flap for which i am using the uh, monopolar cautery i mean it is much faster with the monopolar cautery when compared to the harmonic monopolar cautery only disadvantage is the smoke and this covid era you should have a smoke evacuator um, to reduce the amount of the, what you call to the operator as well as to the theater attendants and uh, cut cut it till you reach a normal tissue here anteriorly the adenomatic tissue is excised a quite chunk of the tissue is excised and uh, still as far as possible try to have a radical adenomyectomy which reduces the bulk of adenomyotic tissue and here also you're pushing the dye here you see the dye coming out that means you're nearing the cavity even though the endometrial cavity may be a slight leak slightly open so after you excise the adenomyotic tissue now comes a huge crater which you have to suture look for the bleeding points and uh, if at all there is any bleeding you can uh, go for the coagulation here a little bit of the adenomyotic tissue is excised with the harmonic harmonic also causes a little bit of smoke due to the uh, uh, combustion of the gases and a few bits of adenomyotic tissue in the anterior wall is also excised here it is wide open you can go right into the base don't go through the endometrium make it sub endometrial and once you're taking a good sub endometrial stitch uh, you're taking you're taking you can take a mattress type of stitch sub endometrial stitch so that the dead space is obliterated interrupted stitches is quite good enough uh once you're sutured you can ask assistant to just hold on uh, to the thread to reduce the tension and once you have completed two three sub endometrial stitches now we go for the deep mattress and the superficial mattress stitch which i showed you earlier so in this case uh, two layer closure we are done of course it is adenomyosis the initial layer was uh, sub endometrial interrupted mattress stitches here again for the outer layers which is almost half of it we are going with the deep mattress and the superficial mattress and uh, you can have a good uh, uh, occlusion of the opposition of the anterior and posterior walls and uh, this type helps to reduce the bleed reduce the small bleeders also and attain hemostasis and approximation is also good enough and this is the type of stitch or the sutures which we do for adenomyosis the other type of sutures you can put but you find that sometimes it cuts through and you are put in difficulties and there is wide approximation of the tissue required so interrupted i feel is a my personal choice even though it differs from one person to other now i come to the third video uh this patient had uh, adenomyosis a little bit on the anterior wall and posterior wall um, we may call it uh, not at a complete it's a complete adenomyosis you deal with here you have to put an incision antero posteriorly we put a posterior incision alone here you find the tubal patency has been checked tubal patency is okay the the endometriotic deposits have been coagulated and here you find that diluted vasopressin is injected you can put an oblique incision or an antero posterior incision uh here i am putting an oblique but it's to it's converted to antero posterior incision according to the adenomyoma anteriorly uh you can excise the adenomyotic tissue sometimes you may have to do a hemi um, what you call hemi make it as a hemi uterus once you are excised 
uh, the adenomatic tissue you can excise with a harmonic uh, ace and uh, you find look adenomyomas will be there sometimes fibroids are also seen here this uh, looks like a localized adenomyoma also along with adenomyosis and the anterior yeah, and the posterior your video posterior. I, can't, I can't see i don't know whether others can see you're not seeing no i yeah, can't see but yeah. others are seeing you cannot see Yo, I think uh, we will go once again for this video. The because your videos were very good. Now it's clear. Ah, uh, yeah, now it's clear. Yeah, I told you that is uh, the tubal patency being checked, the adenomatic deposits in the pouch of Douglas being uh, coagulated. It's nice, Hafiz. You are intimated beam because there is a, other audios are all off, so I'm not. I was not aware that it, the video was not running. And here we put an oblique incision, which we converted uh, because there was a five uh, adenomyosis more towards the right wall, or an oblique or an anteroposterior incision is put, and you excise right direct, directly into the adenomyoma, and the principles are the same. Do a wide excision, excision till you see a normal myoma, normal healthy. Myoma. My metal tissue. The harmonic uh, knife is quite good enough. Here you find uh, the adenomatic tissue is excised from the anterior wall, and once you are excised completely, then you can go to the posterior wall also. And here I was just telling that once uh, once it is your enlarged, you get. We are incising the adenomatic tissue. Tissue, as told earlier, there is no plane of cleavage, so don't wait for looking for the capsule as you see in the fibroid. You have to make a plane, and the best way of making a plane is to about going about 0.5 to 1 centimeter away from the cirrhosis into the myometrium, and uh, just uh, enucleate it, encircle it with your harmonic. And uh, because uh, it's time-consuming, you have to go slowly alone. You can't move fast. And uh, excise the tissue till normal, healthy tissue is seen. Sometimes you may have to open up the uh, cavity here to excise up to the cavity. And uh, here you find the active blade of the harmonic is used to excise the hormon, the adenomatic tissue on the anterior and posterior wall. And uh, once you're excised. You find the base uh, actually bleeding is less. Uh, my experience is adenomatic tissue bleeds less. Maybe it's due to vasopressin, but overall I find that uh, more of due to the fibrous tissue associated with it. And uh, vasopressin actually lasts for about 20 to 25 minutes. And once you excised the adenomatic tissue, put it in the powder Douglas, then catch the uh, what you call the posterior adenomatic tissue, and you excise the adenomatic tissue. And go right up till you see the healthy tissue. Margins you can see, see some sort of a small adenomatic tissue which you can excise towards the end also. But radical wide excision cytoreductive is the uh, treatment of choice in adenomyectomy. Ma small partial hesitant myomectomy is not going to do good. Patient still is symptomatic, and you find the reproductive outcome is also quite bad in this type of group. Once you excise, you can look for, as told earlier, the interrupted mattress stitches is put subendometrial. It helps to approximate the tissue also. Uh, it is put subendometrial, and you find that the interrupted stitches, especially mattress, helps you to approximate this tissue and bring the tissue. And normally, you find that, that after adenomyomectomy is a huge crater which you have to approximate. But this type of stitches helps you to approximate. And uh, once you have put the mattress stitch, you can have, go for the uh, knotting and ask your assistant to step on to the knot so that the tightness is being maintained. Two to three stitches or three or four stitches to be put subendometrially to approximate the myometrium. Then the choice is yours. You can go for a, a vicryl. In this case, we are going with a barb suture. Once you have put the interrupted suturing uh, low, lower down, we are using the barb suture, a continuous suture, because major portion of the 
what you call the myometrium has been closed by this uh, interrupted sutures. Um, this is not a barb suture. This is still an interrupted stitch. But I think this we are taking. Now we are taking the barb suture. So you can take a complete uh, two-layer closure. You can have the uh, what do you call the baseball stitch, uh, inward inside-out stitches, so that you have a better. Uh, there's the inside-out stitches taken with the uh, barb suture, and you find better approximation of the myometrium mucus. So the principle is to avoid dead spaces. Go for the approximation of the myometrium. If you find that approximation is good enough, you can still use the barb suture to closure. There is no hard and fast rule that you have to close in two layers with the interrupted stitch. All depends upon the type of case you are dealing. It is almost oblique. Sometimes you have anterior posterior adenomyosis, which you have to execute in the same way. We always put in the seed, we put a drain, and uh, use our modulator to cut it out and uh, send it for histopathology. And later on, after a gap of two months or maximum three months, we can ask them to conceive. Coming to the last uh, last video, before I go on to the couple of slides, uh, this patient had a combination. Uh, here you find the ovaries are stuck behind. She had. Uh, uh, endometrium on the right ovary, which is about four to five centimeters. Uh, here also, you find uh, we are releasing the uh, chocolate cyst from the base and releasing the. Commonly, we find posterior wall is the site of the adenomyosis is in more than 50 to 60 percentage of the cases. And the principles are same. Once you go to the posterior wall adenomyosis, you find no cleavage. Uh, you find the, the friable type of tissue. Uh, don't give a GNRH analog. So mostly, sometimes you find patients coming to us after get, getting two, three GNR, GNRH analogs. You find the plane of cleavage is also less in this group and more difficulty if you give GNRH analogs. So we don't give GNRH analogs uh, pre-op. Uh, we may give it post-op, especially when these patients are going for IVF. Here, a wide excision of the tissue is being done. Here you are using monopolar cautery also uh, to excise the uh, excise the adenomyosis tissue. Harmonic as well as you want to speed up the surgery, you can use the monopolar cautery, and uh, we can have the feel of adenomyoma lower down also, and that adenomyoma also has to be excised. It can be an adenomyoma sometimes associated fibroid is also seen. And uh, do an in-drop scan also whenever you are in doubt whether you excise the whole tissue. We usually do a transvaginal ultrasound to find out whether we excise the adenomyotic tissue, especially in adenomyosis as well as fibroids, whether we are left behind any fibroids also. Here the subendometrial stitches have been taken. The myometrium is approximated. And once you have approximated the myometrium, then the choice is yours. You can go for uh, uh, interrupted mattress stitches, or you can go for the vicral continuous for the uh, what you call uh, barbed the continuous sutures also. But the major bulk, I think, you have to approximate to bring the approximate the tissue. The interrupted tissue almost takes care of almost uh, more than half of the uh, myometrium. Better approximation, the hemostasis is also better, and you find then your job is easily done when you do a continuous stitch the outer layer. The two layer closure is recommended, especially when you have gone up to the cavity. Single layer closure may be done in myomectomies, but here also we are going the second layer, we are going with the V lock suture, a barb suture which we use. And you can uh, use the uh, what you call um, the inside out technique, baseball stitches to approximate the myometrium, and the procedure is entirely the same what I have shown earlier. So this is in short regarding the video. I just have a couple of slides more before I wind up the program. And uh, coming to the
commonly we find the association coming to the pregnancies after combined therapy. So I told you just giving GnRH analog, the pregnancy rates are pretty, uh, pretty less. And if you combine surgery with GnRH, uh, people find that the combined therapy gives you more success. And this is from the literature. Uh, the largest series by Wang et al. He has done an adenomyomectomy with GnRH analog. The clinical pregnancy rate was quite good. And um, out of the 114 patients, 35 patients, 79 percentage of the patients uh, clinical pregnancy occurred and successful delivery occurred in 32 percentage of the patients. So all others you find that the results are the numbers are very small. So whenever you do, you may have to go for a combined therapy. You find your success is quite good according to these others. And um, looking at the successful pregnancies after conservative surgery alone with adenomyosis, and the others which I would take will be a VANC, still 51 cases where surgery alone, adenomyomectomy alone was done. And he could get a pregnancy rate of uh, 20 out of uh, 51, that is 74 percentage. And delivery 17 out of 51, that is 63 percentage delivery rate. So that is quite good with surgery alone. So it depends upon your choice. If you don't believe uh, in GNRS, then you go with surgery alone and look at your pregnancy rate. Kishi et al, 102 cases, conservative surgery alone. The clinical pregnancy rate he quoted was 41.3 percentage, where the woman was less than 39 years of age. And uh, as the age crossed 40 years, the pregnancy rate was dismal 3 points, a very low 3.7. So whatever surgery you do, you have to do before the woman reaches 40 years of age. So cytoreductive surgery also gives you good results in expert hands. A wide excision of the tissue is excised. And dramatically, you find the post-operative results by Grimbysis, fertility sterility, reported that uh, after complete adenomyomectomy, the reduction of pain was 82 percentage. Oh, and uh, after partial adenomyomectomy, uh, it was 81 percentage. And the reduction of bleeding occurred in almost 68.8 percentage of the patients, whereas partial adenomyomectomy, 50 percentage. So reduction of pain and bleeding occurs after adenomyomectomy, and the patient wants to conserve the uterus. That is the procedure of choice. We come to Osada's uh, report in 2018, fertility sterility, the surgical approach, published cases, laparotomy and laparoscopic adenomyomectomy. And he had 1,007 patients. I wonder how much patients he gets. And wishing to conceive was 598 patients. And uh, 221 of 598 conceived after his method of uh, adenomyomectomy. That is uh, giving you a pregnancy rate of 37 percentage. And abortions occurred in 27 percentage of the cases. Deliveries occurred in 82. And rupture uterus occurred. So this is one of the things you have to keep in mind especially the Osada's technique, a triple flap, all the chances of rupture is that you have to keep in mind. So elective cesarean is recommended for those patients who have undergone adenomyomectomy. Uh, I think uh, we'll start uh, answering the questions. Uh, any role for uh, progesterone IUD in adenomyosis? Abhis can answer or? Progesterone intraitin de device. Yeah, ah, indeed, See, it's not very clear. Actually, there are some studies which shows that the bleeding definitely reduces, and progesterone intrauterine devices will reduce the bleeding, but not that much of uh, um, uh, dysmenorrhea. See, the reduction or the effect is more on menorrhagia compared to dysmenorrhea. But one thing you have to understand is that these are all temporary treatment. And it will be effective only in 30% of the cases, not in all cases. And of course, on infertility patient, patients who are uh, preferring to have children, then definitely uh, it is not the choice. Adenomyomectomy will be the ideal choice. Uh, but in case of probably uh, the menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea who have completed childbearing, probably can have a trial of uh, intrauterine device with uh, yes. this IUC. Next question is, how will you dilute and administer injection vasopressin? I think, what uh, we usually, uh, 
What we usually do is 20 units of vasopressin is taken in 100 ml or 150 ml depending on the size of the uterus or the fibroid and administer. The maximum dose which you can uh, go up to is 60 to 80 units, not more than that. Uh, I normally use 20 units in uh, 200 ml and uh, I inject uh, once the, uh, what, what is called, uh, once it becomes blanched, then I stop the injection and uh, yeah, I may repeat it later on. Yeah, it's not always needed to inject the full um, uh, solution. Once it is blanched, you can stop it. Jay Krishnan has come back. Huh. Yeah, yeah, we had a power failure during the closing stages. We had put the generator also still, I think, errors can occur with the machines also. So I'm back with you. Just a few slides, I think we can take the questions now. Yeah. Uh, we uh, have the third question. Yeah. Two questions we answered. Uh, one question about the adenomyosis and uh, IUCD. Uh, sorry, the uh, progesterone. Adenomyosis, Jay Krishnan. Your question is on adenomyosis. What's the question on? I, didn't see, I can't see the questions over here. Marina or similar uh, thing in uh, adenomyosis. Marina or? Role of Marina, progesterone IUD. I think that is an alternative uh, for uh, adenomyosis, but uh, once you go for adenomyectomy, you hardly think of uh, role of Marina. Unless uh, you're not able to, it, it turns out to be a diffuse adenomyosis and you're not able to do a complete surgery. So I think once you go ahead with adenomyomectomy, you have to go for a wide excision, even if it's a focal or a diffuse adenomyosis. The only role for when you do an adenomyomectomy, when you look for um, marina is you're not able to do a complete surgery and there is diffuse adenomyosis. So otherwise, um, we hardly go for, for um, what you call the marina for uh, during adenoma, during the surgical procedure. Apart from other options, just like any other option, you can try uh, Marina, but uh, when you come back with the surgery, the results, uh, it is good for the pain and bleeding. When you're worried about the fertility potential of the patient, I think we can't put Marina for two years and three years and ask them to wait and repeat the scan. The best way will be to go for the surgery and excise it. Then you can think about whether she requests uh, two or three doses of GnRH and then you can take her for IVF. Jagrishan, do you give GnRH for all cases of adenomyomectomy? Post op. Uh, we give uh, GnRH only for those patients with adenomyosis going for, especially when they're having uh, severe endometriosis or adenomyosis, uh, which is massive enough after adenomyomectomy when we are planning for IVF. Routinely for uh, otherwise, we seldom give. Suppose a patient comes back, is symptomatic or comes back later with uh, Pain of bleeding, we may add. Otherwise, uh, normal protocol, fertility preservation after adenomyomectomy, we may give two doses of uh, GnRH, take them for IVF. And otherwise, we find we seldom go for um, GnRH as a routine basis. I think GnRH, there are some studies, if you see the uh, histopathy, if you see the histopathogenesis of fertility in adenomyosis, Mostly it's not due to adenomyosis. It's mostly due to the endometrial abnormality and adenomyosis of the junctional zone. The problem is when you do adenomyomectomy, this junctional zone adenomyosis is never tackled because if you try to tackle junctional zone adenomyosis, it creates a lot of Asherman syndrome because you will destroy the vascularity of the basal layer of endometrium. So in yeah. those cases, actually GnRH or progesterone given three to four months post adenomyomectomy because adenomyomectomy anyway needs three to four months time for the healing of the uh, healing of the wound on the uterus. So that time if you can give GnRH, there are a lot of studies which says that the fertility can be much better. Yeah, and apart from GnRH, I think more and more papers are coming and Dynogest. Dynogest yes. has got three months post-operatively has got the same effect as GnRH analogs. And as told earlier, the nerve factor, nerve inhibitory factors and uh, pain reduction as well as bleeding is less. And that is a good option to give post-operatively for three months before you ask them to conceive. 
especially if you think that the uh, patient had a large adenomyotic tissue and uh, requires little bit medicine this is one of the drugs apart from gnrh you can give after the surgery yeah i think basically what i understood is that gnrh or dinogest doesn't act on adenomyosis but it acts on the endometrium increasing the fertility once you will kumar is any role for uh, progesterone containing iud that is marina uh, sharana kumar it plays an important role but when you are dealing with fertility problems if you put the marina it may take couple of years and um, the pain relief and uh, bleeding uh, is also excellent with marina up to 18 months or 20 months minimum of 2 years but most of the patients do want to go uh, fertility is the problem so if fertility is a problem then you may think of uh, adenomyectomy if fertility is not a problem i think you can go ahead with marina insertion follow up uh, once in 6 months and see the volume of the uterus pain bleeding and the visual analog score also you can take into account one question is jo next question is uh, kindly guide uh, management of 14 year old uh, with the uterus didalysis two uterine cavities two separate cervix with a possible vaginal septum and blocked hemivagina leading to hematosalpings and uh, hematocolpos on one side patient complaints of abdominal pain and irregular scanty period i think uh, if there is a blocked hemivagina definitely it has to be tackled uh you have to identify the site and open and then microscopically you can explore and then completely excise the vaginal septum uh afis do you have any other comment yeah this is typically the ovira syndrome that is the obstructive hemi vagina where you have the ovira syndrome you need to look for renal abnormalities most of the cases we have had so far i think around 25 cases of ovira syndrome and most of these cases we have seen double ureter or renal abnormality one side kidney is not there i think out of the out of the mullerian anomalies we have seen uh, urological abnormalities maximum in ovira syndrome and in this ovira syndrome the best way to tackle is with a resectoscope never go laparoscopically laparoscopically you may diagnose it but uh, resectoscopy is the best way two advantages you are not rupturing the hymen when you do resectoscopic vaginal surgery another thing is it is much easier to do resectoscopically rather than opening up because opening up the vagina because these patients mostly are very young patients who come with pain abdomen and unilateral endometriosis whenever you see unilateral endometriosis you have to think of cryptomenorrhea so these patients the vagina usually will be very small usually so even putting the speculum will be difficult in a 10 year old 11 year old patient coming with ovira syndrome and if you do the resectoscopic surgery you can actually guard the uh, bladder as well as the rectum because because of the pressure in the vagina the bladder and rectum will go more anteriorly and posteriorly and it will be very easy to do it and another thing is with the resectoscope you can even go up to the cervix and sometimes if it is not didelphis you can go right up to the fundus of the uterus to cut the complete septum Afis, have you uh, come across uh, doing a hysteroscopic procedure for adenomyosis? Because we had few patients with polypoidal adenomatous uh, hyperplasia, which we had to do resection of the hysteroscopically. What Probably, is your experience? Uh, polypoidal adenomatous hyperplasia. Many times, when you are doing a, a TCRE, sometimes you will find that you are you are cut into a um, uh, chocolate color material coming in. These are adenomyomas usually, not generalized adenomyosis, which may be missed on ultrasound, and you have taken for TCRE. Otherwise, usually those patients who have adenomyosis are not really recommended for TCRE. But those cases, if you resect that adenomyoma, hysteroscopically it works very well. Yeah, we had uh, one. I patient. had. Uh, yeah, tell Paul, please tell, please. Tell. Uh, I had uh, one case uh, where. Uh, adenomyo localized adenomyoma was all submucous so i could completely yeah. resect uh, hysteroscopically and uh, as abhi said it gives a good result of control of menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea and you can diagnose adenomyosis hysteroscopically by taking biopsy also yeah we had yeah, one case 
one patient oh, yes. uh, had multiple submucous fibroids and uh, it was uh, api typical polypoidal adenomatous uh, lesions and we had to do a, a submucous resection of these fibroids the histopathology came like that as a typical polypoidal adenomyomas and she had in she was a young patient who was uh, planning to have a child and ideally uh, if you deal with this patient you have to look uh, do an mri and do a conservative surgery ask them to conceive as far as possible because malignancy is associated with a typical polypoidal adenomyomas and she may require a hysterectomy later on so sometimes we deal with the multiple submucous just like fibro submucous fibro it is filling the whole cavity i had shown that video in the pertivision also in this panel discussion and it was one of the interesting cases which we had a couple of years back is a typical polypoid adenomatous polyps or uh, adenomyoma it was a typical polypoid adenomyoma it was not polyp just like fibroids it is filling up the whole cavity adenomyoma is on the typicality is on the myometrium not on the endometrium yeah but these are pushing into the cavity you find yeah, because some... i have not seen a typicality of the adenomyoma so far yeah. this has been reported apa has uh, mm. syndromes have been reported in the literature yeah. and you have to follow up mri has to be done there is a possibility of them going for malignancy and for this patient actually fertility was a problem we had a telephonic conversation we lost the follow up but she has not decided to have a child so far and we have, so we lost follow up of the patient but we had a telephonic conversation which uh, her pain and bleeding has subsided but the fertility problem is this still persisting but literature recommends uh, later on you may have to go for a hysterectomy for this group of patients actually the addition i had uh, the same case i did a hysterectomy today uh, for uh, a typical uh, adenomyoma hysterectomy today okay uh, and uh, indication was endometrial biopsy showed uh, uh, this diagnosis and then we posted for his then get done yeah uh, but uh, she was already you... 48 years uh, menorrhagia and it's not a problem yeah this patient which i talked was less than 30 years of age coming from nagargoil side and uh, there's one question for you dr paul uh, do we have to do salpingectomy at the time of uh, such uterine anomaly maybe the case which you told the uh, question for marchana mohan regarding whether you have to do salpingectomy at the time of uterine anomalies dr uh, question to dr ideally, paul I, uh, ideally we can uh, preserve that uh, hydrosalping open it up and once you drain it but this case was a gross hydrosalpings and at the moment our main concern was the uterus cervical uh, this uh, cervical vaginal reconstruction so that's why i did the oh. well i always Otherwise, feel that we should never we should never do salpingectomy in cryptomenorias because once you release the cryptomenoria this tube will come back to normal even if it is gross uh, hematosalpings and edematous usually once you relieve the cryptomenorrhea even the endometriosis as well as the tube we have seen coming back to completely normal so even endometriotic cystectomy we do not do because that will only reduce the ovarian reserve we can definitely preserve the tube but this particular yeah. case uh, we decided uh, in that direction but in those uh, cases regarding... where... yeah you can speak yeah. as a piece So in those yeah, cases the case. where the cervical atresia is there, cervical agenesis is there, there are two things which I will have to add on. See, the agenesis will usually most of the cases will not be only for cervix; it will be for the complete vagina. So in those cases where the vagina is agenesis of vagina is there, there will be a vaginal plate. So this vaginal plate can be clearly isolated, and this vaginal plate has to be excised when you do a vaginoplasty. otherwise the chances of shrinking of the vagina is much more higher if you do not excise the vaginal plate or else you'll have to open in between the plate so what has to be done is what we do is we always do in these cases an ileal vaginoplasty so after excising the vaginal plate completely and part of the cervix also can be excised so that the chances of re um, um, blockage of the cervix is much lesser Dr Paul how is the follow up of your patient with cervical atresia whether you oh, she, she's she. got married 
No, no, she is, is uh, just uh, just one and a half years back. She is menstruating normally, and uh, she uh, infrequently used that because we use the vestibule to create the vagina. That is, uh, patient is completely asymptomatic. And she uses the what you call a pipette or something. Something you were talking about. Ah, yeah, that's true. Because you, she's uh, a yeah. very small, very small girl and uh, hardly any yeah, uh, space for uh, anything to insert. And the well, one, girl, one problem so if you one problem if you do the pull through of the cervix is that the vagina gets very shortened. That is why an ilium has to be kept and the full length of vagina can be achieved. Uh, pull through can be done only when part of vagina is there. No, but that is, uh, I already showed uh, it's almost 5.5 centimeter vagina is still there. Uh, there have been uh, one uh, Italian study where yeah. they have routinely used this technique and they say this traction itself causes elongation and uh, they are telling uh, they have good results. So no, but when you keep medium, something. you have a fantastic, really fantastic long vagina and the you know that the mucosa also the transformation is much better. But somehow and Hafiz, you have got novel, experience. Uh, hmm? You yeah, have got experience with iliac, iliac uh, resection and uh, using iliac uh, uh, intestine as a vagina. Iliac, what is iliac, your experience? Ileal ileal, ileal, uh, transposition. We take a part of ileum which is around 11 to 14 centimeters of ileum with the vascularity maintained and then put it in the place of vagina. One part is connected to the vulva and the other part is cupping the cervix. It will cup the cervix completely. So this will be exactly like the normal cervix and fornix and all those things. And uh, the menstruation is uh, regained. And for the cervix, if you feel that it is too much long and fibrous, you can keep the appendix. You can actually thread the, you can take do appendicectomy, thread the appendix on to the follies and keep it near the cervix. And suture it, it works fantastically well. Otherwise, refibrosis is much more common. Even today, we have a refibrosis with Jab actually. So she's coming for a redo surgery where we are planning to open it from the uterine cavity now. So, what but, is uh, the follow up regarding, regarding the strictures and what is the follow up of this group of patients which you undergone uh, an iliac loop? Uh, yeah, ileal vaginoplasty for preservation of the uterus, we are getting a lot of patients now. But these are, it's not that it's common, but these are patients clubbed from all over the place. And uh, I think we must have done more than 35 ileal vaginoplasties by now. And the follow up and the results are really, really good because menstruation definitely these patients achieve. And the uh, only problem is dilatation of the ileum because slowly, these are all mostly small patients like. Uh, Seven years, twelve year patient because the cryptomenorrhea is very painful for these patients. So these patients slowly we need to dilate. The problem of dilatation is when you push the dilator, the ileum can get detached from the vulva. So we are trying to make a dilator which will be smaller, it can be kept in the ileum and slowly it can expand rather than pushing the dilator to uh, expand. So that kind of a dilator will be very good for these patients and by the age of um, Around 18, they will create, you will have a nice dilated vagina. We had tried sigmoid vaginoplasties. Sigmoid vaginoplasty, the uh, vagina will be much more broader and the diameter will be higher. But uh, we had a lot of uh, false discharge when we did sigmoid vaginoplasty. So we had stopped that. But literature, some cases say that a lot of false discharge is there. Some case, some workers are quite happy with sigmoid vaginoplasty. Uh, I had seen one uh, yeah. yeah. actually done by Shirodkar himself and uh, I saw many years back I saw one patient, uh, quite old patient, come with a complete prolapse of this, uh, uh, this uh, sigmoid bowel uh, into the third degree prolapse of the vagina. It will be like a rectal prolapse. <laughs> rectal prolapse. Uh, Hafiz, there are two questions for you. How will you check small bowel, small bowel after adicellulysis and tips for separating bowel and obliterated POD? The question asked yeah, by an attention. Yeah. Small bowel checking is one of the most difficult things. The only way to understand small bowel injuries is when you adicellulysis. 
So that is why whenever you do the small bowel additional SS, you have to be careful at each that which you are making. Because unlike large bowel, where you can put in methylene blue and test it, we do not do the air or other things. What we do is we do the methylene blue test, which I feel is the best method of uh, testing the large bowel. But small bowel, you cannot really do this methylene blue uh, uh, testing with small bowel. Another method of testing large bowel is to put a trocar through the anus and put in the telescope. 10 mm telescope can be put and you can inject air so that you can see the bowel very nicely and you can go up to the sigmoid. So any rectal injury is very nicely seen, like you do a cystoscopy. It's very nicely seen when you do a sigmoidoscopy with the telescope and the trocar and the air which uh, balloons it. So another question was uh, obliterated POD. What is the technique in uh, releasing the addition? Yeah. Obliterated POD, the best method to release the addition is never do a uterine, use a uterine manipulator. Use a myoma screw and nicely pull it up. When you pull up the uh, myoma screw with the uterus with the myoma screw itself, most of these additions will become a little loose and it will be much easier to dissect it. Another thing which I have already shown is the lateral uh, window which can occur in the lower part of the obliterated POD like the lateral window of the bladder. The lateral window of the rectum also is there where the additions are not there. So you dissect that area, get into the normal rectovaginal septum and it will be much easier to dissect it upwards rather than starting the dissection from above downwards. You start from the normal area to the adherent area, the additions will come out much more easier. I think one more question uh, is there from Veena Mani, but I'm going to direct it towards Dr. Paul. Uh, by avoiding uh, suturing of the UV fold in cesarean section, and uh, can we avoid adherent bladder, or how can we avoid uh, what you call dehiscence of the scar in uh, in cesarean section? What technique uh, do you recommend? That's what uh, Veena Mani wants to know. Because we find a lot of cervical pregnancies and isthmocyl, cervical uh, ah, yes. cesarean section scar dehiscence. Yeah, isthmocyl uh, has definitely increased nowadays. Yeah. Do you have any techniques uh, to advise for cesarean section closure uh, to prevent this problem? That's what the uh, doctor wants to ask. So I have redirected the question. It was for Hafiz, but I thought uh, Dr. Paul is uh, let him talk on this, and uh, then we can. Uh, I did a cesarean 20 years back. <laughs> no, no, no. Any no. advice? Uh, Any advice? Related? But, it's the most um, yeah. But I don't know whether uh, the actual uh, technique can actually reduce this. Uh, because uh, all of us have been taught in a similar way and uh, the technique of suturing, all of us are doing, uh, gone back to the two-layer closure, no? Compared to layer. the single layer. Yeah, I think there is a study going on comparing two-layer and one-layer and they found that the two-layer closure, the chances of isthmocyl is much less. The study is not complete. The initial studies have shown that... Uh, right. the it is very clear that nowadays isthmocyl has increased uh, suddenly. And, Definitely. Uh, yeah. One thing is uh, the awareness and the diagnosis has increased, plus uh, yes. the actual number of serine also has increased. And, and don't uh, you feel, Paul, definitely the uh, chances of bladder getting adherent on the upper part can be reduced by not suturing the bladder fold? I think that's a, that's a good suggestion. We should uh, try to avoid uh, suturing the bladder back. You can just leave it. And Hafiz, the last question for you, uh, how do you de deal with the dehiscence of the uterine scar in a woman who is planning to have a child? Previous cesarean scar dehiscence has come with an ultrasound report of scar dehiscence. And what advice will you go for a hysteroscopic approach, uh, laparoscopic approach, or leave the patient alone? Yeah, in cases where there is a partial dehiscence, most of the time you will see an ultrasound, something like a wedge on the cervix. In those cases where the wedge is there and especially patients who had multiple C-section, you don't have to do anything really for the wedge of the uh, car. It's not an isthmocyl, it's just a wedge which will be seen actually in almost 60% of the uh, patients. 
and since it is on the cervix you don't have to do anything anyway you are going for an elective c section for more than two uh, cesareans already done why we say that it no, nothing need to be done because in the intrapartum period this wedge doesn't extend the cervix doesn't distend only the upper part or the fundus or the, or the uh, body of the uterus distends in the intra in the antepartum period only intrapartum this can go for a scar rupture you are not waiting for intrapartum you will be doing an elective uh, c section what is the other thing um but the patient they ask you whether there is a risk of rupture due as a pregnancy there is a complete scar dehiscence yeah. and uh, you find sometimes complete. you find only the cirrhosis covering the uterine wound yeah and, complete uh, complete the, scar dehiscence something like an isthmocil definitely it is better yeah. to repair it basically due to two reasons one is isthmocil produces infertility also not only that um, she will have problems in pregnancy like multiple infections and problems like that it produces infertility also so isthmocil i feel if it is going for pregnancy has to be 100% repaired laparoscopically you cannot do a hysteroscopic repair because hysteroscopically isthmocil is not repaired it widens the opening of the isthmocil so that the fluid doesn't get collected laparoscopically you close the isthmocil resect the isthmocil and repair it properly so that will be the ideal thing if she is going for pregnancy so the take home message a complete isthmocil has to be repaired whereas a partial you can leave behind an mri is quite good enough especially when you find uh, the defect is more than 2.5 or 3 mm require a surgical correction a uh, hysteroscopic approach is mainly meant for those people who are not trying to have who have got symptomatic like irregular bleeding and uh, things like that and you can deal them hysteroscopically but not meant for people who are planning to conceive and uh, i think this is the end of the questions i would like to thank uh, dr hafiz as well as dr pg paul for sharing hafiz your slides and videos were quite good enough and uh, actually it shows your experience in dealing with all complications and dr paul uh, for highlighting a similar case which we usually advise hysterectomy where people go for a conservative approach a new case of uh, cervical atresia how it can be dealt uh, by laparoscopically i would like to thank the audience who are still hanging on and uh, this is a bit goodbye to all from the trivandrum of city gynec club I would like to thank uh, Subhadra Madam also, our president, who has joined the meeting from Bangalore. She is with her daughter over there. Thank you, Madam, for joining this session and all the participants who are, who are keen enthusiasts. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you once again, Dr. Hafiz and Dr. Paul.